back to Knights of the Pageless Library. This is an audiobook discussion podcast. I am Ryan Knight, and I will be your host for this episode. And today I'm going to be taking a look at Impact Winter, written by Travis Beecham and narrated by a full cast of people. If you have anything to say about this book or anything else, really, please feel free to reach out to us. KOTPL.pod at gmail.com is by far the easiest way to get a hold of us. And I gotta say, I'm in Las Vegas right now. And instead of hanging out downstairs in the casino, I'm hanging out upstairs with you guys doing this episode. Because I really haven't been wanting to do it, but I'm making myself do it tonight. So you're welcome, I guess. Either way, thank you guys for listening. I really appreciate it. And now on with the review. Impact Winter is an Audible original book that came out in 2022 by Audible Originals, LLC. And it looks like maybe the original book came out in 2022 by Shoe Leather Digital Inc. Just so we're clear too, I'm doing Season 1. There is Impact Winter Season 1 as well as Season 2. Now, I don't know anything about Travis Beecham, but it looks like this might be kind of what he's known for. He has Impact Winter Season 1 and Season 2. Well... Uh, let me rephrase that. Impact Winter and Impact Winter Season 2 on Audible that were both done in 2022 and 2023. And then it looks like he also has maybe like an exclusive interview done on there as well. So I think this might be his claim to fame. Uh, please feel free to let me know if I'm wrong about that. Maybe he's done other books that just have not become Audible books. But, you know, we're all about the audio over here. So please feel free, though, to let me know if there's other stuff he has done that is worth looking at or just worth noting basically i said all of that but after a quick google search i realized that travis beecham has done quite a bit as an american screenwriter he is best known for writing and co-writing the films dog days of summer pacific rim clash of the titans and proposing the concept for the amazon prime fantasy tv series carnival row uh that's all on the wikipedia page but there you go so (laughs) he's he's done quite a bit other than write this book The narration done in this is done by a full cast, as I said, and some of these names stood out to me upon my first listen, actually. Um, Liam Cunningham, who plays Jespin Belgrave in the story. Um, I will try to remember to put his face right up here on the screen for any of you watching on YouTube. Uh, But you will recognize him, as I did, maybe, from uh, Game of Thrones. Um, And then we have a couple other big names in this. I want to say that Bella Ramsey is also in Game of Thrones. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Just looking at her picture, it looks like she is. But then we also have most of the more notable people in the story are Holiday Granger, Esme, 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 Creed Miles. I'm probably saying that incorrectly. Himesh Patel, probably saying that one also incorrectly. And David Gyasi in this story. We have Caroline Ford and Indira Varma. Those are just some of the more notable people that Audible has chosen to put on, you know, the front page here and make their names known. But this was done. There are a lot of other people credited as well for voices and extra voices and things like that in this story. I've voiced my opinion about full cast and dramatization performances before. And I'm without getting too spoiler heavy on this one, I'm going to say it falls under the same complaints that I typically have about them. The voice acting in this one is good. Uh, I mean, it's very good. The sound quality is extremely good, which I would probably come to expect from, you know, a company that has the money to produce something that sounds extremely good. But to me, this one almost borderlined on ASMR at times, where they were more focused on the little sound effects in the background versus the actual voices being spoken. So that was an issue for me. But I'm I'm not going to get too much into it till I get to my recommendation here. This is a pretty short book, comes in only at 4 hours and 59 minutes. I actually listened to this one twice before recording this, and I still probably won't be able to remember half of the stuff, so please feel free to correct me on any mistakes that I make during this review. Okay, is this one easy to follow and easy to listen to? Mm, Yes and no. I think it's easy to follow. The story's pretty straightforward. This is kind of a post-apocalyptic vampire story. Which, on the surface, sounds great, but I will get into my thoughts on that here in a minute. I think it's pretty easily listening, but again, I'm not a huge fan of dramatizations. I would... I'd almost prefer to just have a movie playing in the background and listen to a movie over a dramatization for some reason. This one especially really 
hit a few boxes that I didn't like. Uh, as I said, they kind of have these weird like ASMR type sounds that are just a little too, it's almost cringy. They are so, those sounds are so crisp, but even at times the sound effects drown out the actual narration, which is an odd choice to me. I mean, yeah, overall, the story is easy to get through. It's it's pretty straightforward, to be honest. Um, and I think that's to its detriment. And I will get to that here in a minute after I pass the recommendation and the spoiler wall. And my recommendation on this one, unfortunately, is a resounding do not listen to this. I'm well aware of the fact that I think I'm in the minority on this. So this book has over 30,000 ratings as of time of recording on Audible with 4.6 stars out of 5. The strange part, though, is if you scroll to the actual reviews, it's very mixed, um, which is very strange to me that uh, they're so mixed, um, whereas the average apparently is almost five full stars. A lot of the top reviews that I glanced through, though, kind of share my sentiments as well. And I forgot to mention this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow, very professional of me. This book is free on Audible. Um, that <laughs> kind of important information that you don't even actually have to pay for this one if you want to listen to it. Um, it is free. I don't know if that's just a promotional thing, if it's an Audible original with your, you know, your Audible subscription or what, what the reasoning is. But if you have Audible, you can listen to this one for free. So again, probably should have mentioned that earlier, but there you go. Now you know that it's free. And I'm still going to tell you not to listen to it. I think that's one of its biggest redeeming qualities, is that it is free. Even upon re-listening to this book, there just was not a lot that I could bring myself to say that I enjoyed. Uh, again, I will say that the sound quality is good, but I find this story not that interesting. I found the setting... Um, the story is called Impact Winter because a comet hits the Earth and plunges it into a kind of <laughs> Impact Winter. Weird. If you just read, though, like what the description on Amazon says before you buy, or excuse me, on Audible, before you buy this, it makes it sound like the world is completely dark with tons of snow. And that's kind of the idea that I got going into it. But I am... 99% sure there are multiple times in the book where they say you need to finish this before it gets dark. They rarely ever talk about needing charged flashlights or recharging flashlights or light of any kind to go do anything, which wouldn't make any sense. If it were dark, that should have been something that got brought up a lot. Um, and I say all that to say this, that I don't think the setting, the Impact Winter setting, it didn't need to be there. The story... This post-apocalyptic vampire story could have taken place in any post-apocalypse. It didn't need to be a winter apocalypse because it's rarely actually ever brought up during the story. The environmental storytelling that could have been used here to great effect, I don't think was used at all, in my opinion. The few times that it is brought up doesn't really seem to have any sort of impact, <laughs> see what it did there, on the story itself. It doesn't seem to hamper our, you, you know, people that we're following in any way, shape, or form, and it doesn't really seem to matter, like I said, that what the setting is. This could have been told anywhere. Uh, I, I just, this one didn't do it for me. And I kind of thought, you know, post-apocalyptic vampire story? Sounds great. You know, the vampires come out of hiding because all of humanity has been plunged into their world now in darkness all the time. Sounds great. I'm all for it. And I just... I didn't get a lot of anything from this. I didn't get a lot of really good world building. For me personally, if you had a different op opinion, please feel free to share that with me. I didn't really resonate with any of the characters very well. Um, the lead character without getting too spoilery, in my opinion, falls into a bit of a Mary Sue trap. Um, you know, take that as you will, but that's just my opinion on how her story plays out. I couldn't really get invested in any of the characters because there were multiple times in the story where somebody would die, 
like, you know, we'd get some really good sound effects and audio effects of them dying and me going, wait, who was that? Who was that character? So that's the kind of stuff I think you're in for if you come into this one. I mean, if you want to give it a listen because it's free and because it's short, by all means. But don't say I didn't warn you. I listened to this one twice, so you wouldn't have to listen to it at all if you don't want to. Again, though, please feel free to comment below, send me an email, and let me know why I'm wrong if you choose to, but that's my opinion about it. So now with that, I'm going to pass the spoiler wall, and I'm going to get in a little more detail about why I feel the way I feel about some of this stuff. I kind of took some hasty notes here, uh, and I'll try to kind of go into depth a little bit more about why I say the things that I say. Now, I think the performances in this one are good. Don't get me wrong. The voice performances are pretty solid because, again, you got some big name actors and actresses in here doing voices, which uh, I'm kind of torn on that. I've actually been thinking about doing an episode completely about that because I think that, you know, Hollywood movies fall into this trap where they're using celebrity voices versus actually getting a good voice actor to do voices. Um, so this... This doesn't necessarily fall into that trap, in my opinion. I think that everybody in this one does a good job. Again, as I mentioned, the overbearing of the kind of ASMR sounds, it just didn't do it for me. I mean, great. They had a very high quality sound equipment. They could definitely get some really gritty noises in there, but it just didn't... I don't know. It didn't lend itself to anything in this. Now, I already said that I'm not a fan of dramatizations, and I think that this one is the icing on the cake as to the reason that I am not. I think it's very hard to pull off a dramatization with no narration, right? Or no, or any story for that matter with no narration that's not a visual movie or something like that. This book does a very, very strange thing. Doesn't have a narrator, but because we're meant to be kind of listening to a movie essentially play out they do this really weird thing where characters have to say things that they probably would never be saying just so that we can understand what's going on and i really really did not like that i mean the characters you know just i'm past the spoiler wall now so hopefully you don't get too spoiled but this guy pulls this silver stake out of this one gal's chest and throws it off to the side and then he says there that's the silver removed and throws it off to the side but it's like he probably wouldn't have said that like there's no reason for him to have said that the only reason he is saying that is to tell us what the you know squidgy sound effect and then the tinkling of metal off to the side was from it was just very strange and I didn't like it maybe I'm just not creative enough to understand it there are a few points of what I would call narration from the main character, but it's very strange because it's hard to know if she is speaking out loud, because I'm pretty sure during most of them she's by herself. So it's hard to understand if she's speaking, if she's thinking, if she's reading. It's very odd. A lot of it falls under, like, if she's describing... Like, she chases down a deer and kills it, and so she has to describe that to us, because it'd be very strange for her to just be like, Oh, there's a deer, I'm gonna go eat it, and then we just hear a bunch of noises and crunching sounds and slurping noises, it'd be very awkward. But the description is almost more awkward when it's told in this regard. Like, if this was any other book, I wouldn't have any problem with that, because there's... The lines are usually very clear when someone is speaking and when someone is saying something in narration or descriptive form. But in this, it, I don't know, just did not work for me. I found it very odd and I thought it took me even further out of the story than I kind of already was. And speaking of the story, I'm going to go ahead and do my best to kind of talk about the overarching story that goes on here. And I think that the entire thing is okay at best, unfortunately. And I, I put this in my notes, so I'm going to talk about it again here, but I I just mentioned it that I... In the description, it's written that the world is plunged into dark. Like, let me just see if I can find it. Yeah, okay, right here, in the Audible Publisher Summary. 
the world is dark, frozen landscape, and then beastly creatures emerge and take over. Can they really be vampires? Now I get that they're obviously they don't want to like spoil a bunch of stuff for you in the summary right here, but that's a little off-putting because it also says right here uh, in quotes, uh, they came after the impact and the firestorms when the sun went dark like they'd been there all along, just waiting. Again, kind of misleading in my opinion because there are multiple times I made sure to listen the second time around multiple times where characters say you need to finish this before it gets dark so either we have some very serious continuity errors or they forgot that that's what they put in the summary that the the sun had gone out now what I was picturing more is that it is basically just snowing and foggy all the time not necessarily pitch black dark all the time so there would still be a day night cycle it's just obviously it's not going to get very bright outside with the fog that's that's how i pictured it the entire time and after re-listening to it and hearing characters say that that's what i'm sticking with so let me know if you think that there's something else going on here and i missed a very important detail and again i will just say this that i I don't think that the environment played a big part in the story at all anyways. I don't think that it was leaned into enough that it's a dangerous world outside of these little homes that humans had kind of created for themselves where they hide. The story takes place seven years after this meteor impact, and I just didn't think that it mattered it didn't sound like the meteor impact on the earth was that big of a deal they were more focused here on telling a vampire story which is fine you can tell a vampire story but there's no reason to have this story where there could have been a lot of really really good world building and then you just kind of brush it off to the side in order to tell your vampire story and i do i gotta say it's a pretty mediocre vampire story at best too i think that there's plenty of other better vampire stories to be heard elsewhere. Dig in, my opinion. There's a couple of really cool details in this. The vampires in this are kind of hierarchical, so there are like what the I'm assuming this is what the humans call them. There's like blighters, there's shades, and then there's uh overlords, I think is what they call them. I think the vampires themselves call them like anointed ones or something. I think I might have put it in my notes. And that was okay, like with a kind of a like cast system for the vampires, but there's no explanation as to what what is what. And maybe that's something that's brought up in the second season of this. I and I don't need to have everything, you know, spoon-fed to me lore and detail-wise, but it would have been nice if even the humans brought it up in like their study, like, hey, we found out this, if someone is bitten and then X, Y, and Z happens, they have a more likelihood of turning into this versus this. Like, there was, there's none of that. There's no, like, zero world building when it comes to that stuff. Because this story was so short, too, it really did feel like they were just kind of rushing to an end. This could have almost been better if it was stretched out into maybe, like, a 10-hour story. So you could get some time to know some of these characters and their storylines wouldn't need to be rushed into. I mean, again, there was plenty of characters who died that I had no idea who they even were. I, I don't remember why I should have cared about them. I don't remember what their role in the story was. None of it. The story even does that on its own at points. There's a quote-unquote siege on this human hideout. And they literally, it's like 30 seconds of dialogue and some slashing noises and growling sounds and stuff. And then afterwards, we're just told, some people died. That's it. That's all the thought that they are given. And that's, I just thought it was really, really unfortunate. I also think that seven years wasn't enough time to have passed for this to be a successful story after the impact. I think the point of this was so that the author could have people who remembered the impact and rem now are living through the changed world, which is fine. That's that's a good idea. But in my opinion, this world would still be in freaking chaos. Seven years, I think, humans would still be extremely 
worried about other humans even i don't think we would still trust each other you know if you had humans hiding out in little pockets around the world and surviving i don't know if they'd be reaching out to each other to try to figure out where they were to see what's going on that's how this book opens up with our main character reaching out to see if there's other people out there so that they can get in touch with them i'm gonna go back to like the dark forest theory that in this situation you might want to stay hidden at least for a good time until you know you're well established enough to reach out for other people i also didn't fully understand the idea that they say that the vampires kind of appeared after the impact but then the vampires make it very obvious later in the story that they've always been there like there's no doubt that they've always been in the background of of the people okay i think i put ascended ones they're either ascended ones or anointed ones is what the vampires call their own overlords if you will it's loosely told a few times that like the overlords can transform into animals i guess in the beginning of the story the humans clearly mentioned that you know the one girl thinks she's maybe seen an overlord one time or maybe killed one or something like that and then we're all of a sudden introduced to like three of them shortly into the story and i i don't like that kind of heavy-handed writing where it's like this is an extremely rare thing that rarely ever happens now here's a whole bunch of them in one place i i'm just not a fan of that and i'm gonna keep saying the girl her name is darcy is the main character's name so hopefully i'll remember that <laughs> going forward this also kind of goes with the story being in a hurry is that i don't think it lets any of the tension hang in the air and i'm not a writer i don't know shit about writing but i know this didn't seem right none of the suspense ever hangs so darcy later in the story at a certain point is locked away by uh, calistrata this very powerful vampire and she uses like a psychic lock on Darcy because she's a more powerful vampire therefore she can overpower her mind and she basically puts up this impassable door in a door frame of a room to lock her in this room Darcy can see that there's no door there but she cannot physically go through it her, her mind will not allow her to and I was like oh that's sweet well how the hell is she gonna get by that oh don't worry like three seconds later another character shows up and just like lets her out it's either that or like this she also has like this vampire lioness thing in her mind that she can kind of like communicate with that also plays a role in that part of letting her out and i there was zero suspense at that point i was like are you kidding me she just escapes this really cool concept of like being imprisoned and she just gets out of it like it's nothing it it was very disappointing. So now I've jumped around a little bit, which is very confusing, but I'm going to go back and I'll just talk about what I can kind of remember of the story. So we start out with Darcy, and she's with this dude. What's his name? He's going to be one of these guys that's uh, Felix. So Darcy and Felix go, and they go to this broadcasting tower, whatever, radio tower. They radio out to the world, right? So they... This is kind of a clever way to fill us in on quite a bit of what's going on in the story. So it's a bit of heavy handed exposition because obviously the two characters need to talk about the stuff so that we as the listener can be filled in on what's going on. So yeah, the impact, you know, made the world covered in snow, darkness, however you want to look at it. And they're kind of reaching out thinking that, oh, it's been seven years. Maybe there's other people that we can reach out to and get a hold of. We jump over to uh, Darcy's sister, Hope, who is at this castle, and they have kind of holed up in the basement of this castle, which is where they've made, like, their outpost with all these other people to their safe haven. Hope is kind of... I can't remember. She's, like, with another dude that she likes or something like that, and they're going to read Darcy's diary. Uh, I, I don't really know why i guess darcy has a lot of information about vampires and they don't come right out and say that they're vampires at this point they kind of dance around the idea of what they are but it's 
it's pretty obvious that that's what's going on. And I'm assuming that the vampires have emerged, like I said, because the world is now dark. It's more like their territory than human territory. These people show up claiming to be like refugees trying to get in there. And uh, Jepson Belgrave is, I can't remember if he's a doctor or something like that, but he brings them in to interrogate them. They're trying to figure out if they're vampires or if they're humans because they are shades which look just like normal people. So the blighters look, I'm assuming, more like zombie vampires. <laughs> shades look like normal people. Overlords look like normal people also, but plus ultra. I, I don't really know how to describe them and how sometimes they know they're overlords and sometimes they have no idea. We get a little bit of exposition here with them interrogating these two people and then they had taken some pills to make sure that the vampires couldn't mind control them. Uh, that ends up not working. The one vampire grabs Belgrave's axe because they like put some UV lights on him. So he grabs his axe and he runs and then the gal is still there. And the dude ends up capturing Hope, I believe. Kind of holding her hostage. Dude ends up getting killed. The dude vampire. I think. <laughs> and they kidnap... They keep the female vampire. Penelope. So, we come to find out that Penelope is in hiding because some story... Something happened where she killed the vampire... <laughs> the offspring... I can't remember what they call them. If they call them offspring... If they turn another person into a vampire, she killed the offspring of this Calistrata vampire lady who's like plus ultra plus again, because she's just like, I guess she's just like the most feared one of them all at this point. But also not that long into the story, I don't even remember why Darcy is out. She ends up getting attacked by Rook, who is also an overlord and he transforms her into a vampire he gives her the option he like bites her and drains her and then before he kills her he asks her if she would like to stay who she is or if she would like to be transformed and she says to do it so he gives her his blood and makes her a vampire now to me if the vampire hunter lady gets turned into a vampire there's going to be some serious struggles here right some serious internal struggles that could possibly bleed over into external lashing out things like that it's going to be very difficult that's not how this story handles it at all she immediately embraces it she thrives on it and turns out of course she's like a badass overlord. She immediately becomes an overlord. It gets brought up later that there hasn't been an overlord in... I don't even remember... several hundred years or some something like that, and... Rook explains it basically as, like, the longer the build-up, the greater the... release? I swear to God, that's how he says it. Which apparently is why... Darcy becomes like this super powerful overlord. So now she's in a bit of a bind because obviously she is a vampire after she was, you know, trying to save everybody from vamp from vampires. So this Calistrata shows up because she's looking for Penelope. And in the meantime, Penelope and Hope have kind of become friends. Penelope has like talked her way into telling hope that she's not that bad you know she's she's just trying to survive too and all this stuff so calistrata comes because she's gonna kill penelope for killing her offspring her daughter i don't even remember how they say it well apparently darcy doesn't like this so she is going to kill calistrata and i don't really know why calistrata kind of when they kind of fight. So Calistrata is going to do this siege on the <laughs> on the place the humans are holed up. So she gathers up all these uh, the blighters and uh, she rips this information from Darcy's mind that there's like a back entrance to this place. 
and they siege the castle. And it doesn't really matter, because at some point, Rook transforms into, like, a black dog or something like that, and he, like, tells all the other blighters to stop and don't do it, and they just stop <laughs> and, and don't do it <laughs> for some reason. So then Darcy fights with Calistrata. Calistrata stabs her with the uh, silver pick thing, which paralyzes her. She has this whole trippy scene where she meets this like vampire lioness thing in her mind, tells her all this stuff, and then she has some like, so she has these flashbacks like with Felix in them, and she has some just weird flashbacks basically. So we're kind of led to think that like Darcy is like the hero of this whole story, because Darcy ends up killing Catas Calistrata. She bites her in the neck and Calistrata can't like regenerate from it. She just ends up bleeding out like a normal human and even Rook doesn't understand why this happens. And then Rook is like, well uh, you gotta uh, I gotta go tell the count the high council about what happened and I'll just say I killed Calistrata. They'll have already felt her death. So this is what I meant when I said that's very poor world building. On one hand, the humans had no idea vampires existed. On the other hand, the vampires have this high council and all of this stuff. And I just feel like, yeah, I get it. Like in every other vampire story, they're supposed to be sec It's supposed to be a secret. You know, obviously they're not going to reveal themselves to humans and things like that. But it just was so clumsily done, I felt like, in this story. Darcy, or excuse me, Hope, ends up deciding she's gonna go out and like hunt vampires too and try to find her sister and like bring her back to all of them and i don't fully remember but i think at the end of the story whole, uh, oh my gosh darcy ends up changing felix too like turning him also into a vampire but it was very like like she kind of attacked him animalistically and then was like oh shit whoops uh do you not want to die and he's like like gurgling and she just makes him a vampire too i swear that's what happened maybe maybe i'm misremembering that but maybe I'm, maybe that's what should have happened in my mind so i'm gonna just step back in here and reiterate that also darcy leaves because now she's also told by she's told by rook about all right i'm getting it mixed up a little bit rook Rook doesn't like the way things are. Basically, he doesn't like being a vampire. He's been alive for a long time. Kind of convinces her that maybe this kind of lifestyle isn't the best for everyone. Calistrata had also mentioned that their kind, the vampires, are the reason the impact winter happened. They prayed to their god, goddess, god, to make it happen. So they think that's why it happened. So Darcy has decided to go put an end to all of this. Either way... Then at the end, so Hope kind of had been trying to live up to Darcy's reputation, right? Darcy was kind of a badass, she had a sword, all this stuff. So Hope starts using all that stuff and then wants Belgrave to train her. And I feel like in both characters, Darcy and Hope, we have zero hero's journey. None. Again, we were in too much of a hurry to tell a vampire story to have any actual meaningful character building. Now I give a little bit of credit where credit is due, because at least Hope, in her end narration kind of of the book, says that she must be pretending pretty well because people think she's really good at what she does or something like that. But I would almost guess that in season two, she's a super badass. Hasn't had to do hardly any learning. Super badass. Darcy was kind of the same way. A bit of a Mary Sue situation where even though she's thrust into something that should have been extremely different, extremely uncomfortable, extremely polarizing, right? Like she went from a vampire hunter to being a vampire. Should have been very jarring for her. No, zero development. She just steps right into it. If you were reading this on the page, you could go from one page where she's a vampire hunter to the next page she's a vampire and you wouldn't know there was a difference. Her character has zero qualms with it after about two minutes. And I just thought that that was very, very disappointing. Now again, I'm not a writer. I don't know how it could have been written better. I just know that it did not feel very well written to me. I, w I would have 
much prefer to spend more time with these characters and get to know them a little bit better and get to learn how they dealt with their struggles. But really, there are no struggles in this book. People, things happen to some of these people and they move on almost immediately. And I think that that's where I take a lot of my issue. Again, it was in too much of a hurry to tell a specific thing to even bother with all of the details surrounding that specific thing. Okay, and I put this in my notes too, so I wouldn't forget to talk about it. The Darcy story also starts to border on like a chosen one territory, and I really do not like that. And she flips the switch so fast from being vampire hunter to vampire lord with no development at all. She goes through very little to no grieving period whatsoever, which I kind of already mentioned. And she also goes through no learning curve when it comes to her new vampire powers. Again, I found this... It's such a fumble. Like, if you're going to give somebody superpowers as a vampire, I hate this bullshit where, like, oh, I can just use them all of a sudden and it's no problem. Like, why couldn't she struggle with those things? Why could she not struggle to learn some of them and go through a little bit of a learning process before she just becomes all-powerful. I don't understand why they would skip over the part that should be arguably the most interesting and make her feel the most grounded and the most relatable. There's very few times, too, I felt like in this story where characters go through any actual, like, diversity that affects them in a meaningful way. We get a couple parts where characters maybe flip-flop on their feelings, but ultimately it doesn't really amount to anything there's very little in the way of like betrayal there's very little in the way of like if i choose x then y and z will happen but that's horrible so in instead i'm going to choose y and z and then x will happen but that's the better of the two outcomes there's very very little of that there's there's hardly any like actual decisions made by the characters it's usually very straightforward this is what i will do this was the correct answer Therefore, that's what it is. Yeah, again, I just, I don't know. I didn't like this one. If it wasn't obvious by now, if you're still here, I really, really appreciate it, by the way. But if it's not obvious by now, I did not like this one. Uh, I just think you can find much better vampire stories elsewhere. So, again, I listened to this one twice, just so you guys don't have to listen to it at all. Its only redeeming factor is that it was free. And if you have a different opinion about it, great. Please feel free to share that with me. I'd love to hear it. And with that, I think I will quit beating this vampire lord turned horse, and I will hopefully catch you guys in the next one.